Good evening. And uh, we are underway with this regular meeting of the Holotus City Council. It is uh, August 25th, 2016, and it is 7 p.m. And uh, before we get started on the agenda, we have a couple of young scouts in our midst here that are working on merit badges. We have uh, Freedom, if you would, Stand, and Daniel. They're here from Troop 484, which is the troop that uh, meets down at the Holotus Lions Club. And uh, they're here working on their communication badges. So uh, pay attention. And if you stay for the whole meeting, we hope you will. You'll learn something. And if you have any questions, feel free to come up and ask, OK? So Freedom and Daniel. Okie doke. Uh, next up on our uh, agenda, we have uh, for starting off the invocation. And tonight, uh, Council Member Massey is uh, going to take care of that. And then we'll have the pledges to the uh, t um, American and Texas flag. So if you would stand for the invocation and pledges. Dear Lord, thank you for the much needed rain. Thank you for being with the Greater Holotus Girls Little League team as they became the World Series champions last week. Bless each of the girls for their hard work and all the people, including their coaches and parents, who helped them achieve this goal. We ask that the parade and celebration this weekend go smoothly and is a great experience for all involved. We ask special blessings on our fire and police forces for their continued safety in their line of work. Tonight, this council asks for wisdom as we deliberate during our meeting, help us to make the right decisions for our community with courtesy and consideration. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one okay, Grace, you said no one signed up for anything, right? Anything. Okay. Well, we'll go through our, our public hearings. It's a process that we're required to, uh, to do, and we have uh, several public hearings listed on our agenda tonight. So I will read uh, the content of the public hearing, and we will go from one to the next since no one signed up to speak. We will open the first public hearing at 7.02, and this public hearing is to give all interested persons the right to appear and be heard on the proposed annexation of property generally located near the intersection of Lago Vista and Wild Lake Holotus, Texas, 78023, and being more particularly described as Bear County Appraisal District Property ID number 241715, and being a 14.649 acre tract of land located in the J.A. Taurus Abstract, number 768, and the T.C.R.R. Company Survey, Abstract number 1026, Bear County, Texas. And since no one uh, signed up to speak to this, um, we will close this public hearing at 7.03. And I would like to announce that we will be having a second public hearing uh, on this annexation item. And it will be held at our next meeting on September 8th, uh, right here in um, the council chambers. And then we will be voting, uh, the council will be voting on an ordinance for annexation at our meeting October 13th. So again, the second public hearing on this item will be September 8th. Okay, our next public hearing, we will open it at 7.04. This public hearing is to give all interested persons the right to appear and be heard on a resolution of the City Council of the City of Holotus, Texas, approving appropriations for the City of Holotus Economic Development Corporation's fiscal year ending 2017 operating and capital budgets beginning October 1, 2016 and ending September 30, 2017 
to support the EDC's programs, projects as defined by Article 5190.6 of the Development Corporation Act of 1979, Sections 2 and 4B of Vernon's Texas Civil Statutes and Cooperatives, authorizing the City Administrator and EDC Executive Director to take all necessary steps to implement the provisions of this resolution incorporating recitals, providing for severability, and adopting an effective date. And we will close this public hearing at 7.05. And I neglected to ask, but if anyone has cell phones or electronic communication devices, if you would please put them on silent vibrator off, we would appreciate it. And I would like to announce um, on the public hearing for the EDC's budget that a second public hearing will be held on the proposed EDC budget again on September 8th. And the Economic Development Corporation Board will vote to approve their budget on September 21st. And it will come to the City Council for action to approve uh, the EDC budget on September 22nd. So again, a second hearing, September 8th. The EDC will vote to, uh, we hope, approve their budget September 21st, and Council will then take action on it on September 22nd. Okay, we will open the next public hearing at 7.06. And this is to give all interested persons the right to appear and be heard on proposed City of Holotus 2000 fiscal year ending 2017 budgets, including but not limited to the general fund, debt service fund, capital replacement fund, municipal court security and technology funds, police training and education fund, school safety fund, PEG or public access channel fund, police state and federal forfeiture funds, Police Explorer Post Fund and Street Maintenance Fund budgets. And we will close this public hearing again since no one signed up to speak at 707. And again, just as a matter of announcement, we will have another public hearing on the Holotus uh, fiscal year ending 2017 budgets uh, on September 8th and then it will come before City Council <clears throat> at the final meeting uh, in September, September 22nd for action at that time. The last public hearing, item number five on the agenda, we'll open at 708. This public hearing is to give all interested persons the right to appear and be heard on the adoption of the proposed tax year 2016 ad valorem or property tax rate. And we will close this hearing uh, also at 7.08. And I would like to announce that uh, the public hearing on the proposed tax rate, the second public hearing will take place on September 8th. Confirm that, Grace, you have 22nd down here, but it, it is the 8th, I didn't pick up on that. And then the City Council will vote on the proposed tax rate at the regular City Council meeting September 22nd. And that meeting again will begin at 7 p.m. right here in the chamber. So uh, we will have our second public hearing on September 8th for the t uh, proposed ad valorem tax rate and then the action item will come before City Council at our regular meeting September 22nd. <clears throat> okay, then that takes us to our next item, which is our open session or citizens to be heard. Again, no one signed up to speak, so we will move <clears throat> directly to our consent agenda. And if you have uh, not familiar with uh, a meeting like ours, uh, consent agenda is made up of items that are considered uh, routine business by not only me but the staff and so it's presented to the council 
as routine business uh, with more than one item. Tonight we have items seven and eight, so it's a fairly short consent agenda. However, the intent is to have one motion and one second by council to approve multiple items. And again, it's to uh, increase the efficiency of the meeting. Uh, the council does have an opportunity to ask questions if we can answer them fairly briefly. If they would like to have an item discussed in detail, they have the option to pull an item. So I would ask council now, are there any questions on items seven and eight? the consent agenda or a request to pull either one of the items no. anybody no questions and no request to pull then i would look for a motion to approve consent agenda items seven and eight mr may i make a motion that we approve consent agenda items seven and eight we have a motion from fredericks do we have a second 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 from villanueva so we have a motion and a second to approve consent agenda items seven and eight. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Consent agenda items seven and eight are approved. That takes us to uh, the rest of our agenda and these are items for individual consideration. And item number nine on the agenda first up is a presentation by Josh, uh, Joshua Mayer, our uh, public works supervisor. And if you recall, uh, council, if you recall several months ago, uh, we presented and you approved the uh, uh, mapping of our streets uh, for various purposes uh, by cardiograph and that's been completed and I was uh, watching Rick and Josh enter a bunch of information into the software and it was pretty interesting so I asked him to put a presentation together for you guys and that brings us here tonight so uh, Josh the room is yours all right thank you mayor thank you council uh, for being here tonight we're purpose is to uh, present our new operation management system uh, basically this system is an asset management and work order tracking system that also gives us the ability uh, through different aspects in the system to assist with uh, multi-year multi budgeting and long-term infrastructure maintenance programs that we're trying to implement here. Uh, the goal tonight is just to, a brief walkthrough of the system and give a broad overview of how it works and how we'll be using it. Uh, we're, hope, we're also hoping that the Mayor and Council will get a general idea of the direction that the department's going. Uh, at some point in the near future, we'll be using aspects of this system to help us decide what type of maintenance and what type of programs to put in for our infrastructure. Uh, this is the home page uh, of the system here. Um, and we're just gonna go through each one of these relatively quickly. These are the different uh, pages involved in the operation of the system. Um, real quick, this is just a general overview of everything that kind of is going on in the program at the moment. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, cost pie chart. Basically, it tells you what we've done the last month and where we spent the money. It gives you your list of activities. Uh, you have things like average time to complete a work task. As we get further into it, you'll I'll get to the get to what a work task is and what it actually does. And then just summaries of our assets and things like that, and different work that we've been performing. So. Uh, the middle part here is a map. Every one of those little blue marks on overlaid on that map is an actual work task item that's been assigned to somebody uh, within the department. So we'll get to what all this mapping stuff does here in just a second. So the first part we're gonna go to is the request section. Um, with this request section, this is how any resident or any uh, city employee that needs some type of work done from our department would request this. There's a link on our city's website under the Department Public Works section of the, and also under the Atom Control section where a resident can just click on it, type in the issue that they want, and then it populates it. I don't know why this isn't pulling up here. It may be taking a while for it to load because of all the information that's in there and it's a new computer that it's never been opened on before. Or it could be a problem with the operator. Uh, maybe. 
All I'm doing is pointing a light, so. Okay, so. That could be the problem. No, it's on. Okay, real quick, this is. He found the color chart. <laughs> this is yeah. the filter section. So as you can see, this number here represents every request that we've ever entered into the system to date. Uh, and that's a request coming from outside the organization or inside. And the reason I left this filter kind of blank is because I just wanted to go over the filter making process with you. It's very simple. So Rick, if you could click on this here, and maybe it'll pull some information up. So this is just a filter. What you're gonna do is go to the status under the field. And under this field, you can pick a number of different things that you wanna look up. But what we're gonna look up is try to figure out what kind of work we got in here. You pick an operator. In this case, we'll use is. And the word here is gonna be open. Once you activate that in the system, uh, no, it's already on, I just click activate. So now you see it took that number from 138, whatever it was, down to 11. This is showing us that there's 11 active work requests inside Cartograph. I'd, and typically a map would show up here and a list of all those requests would be here. So theoretically, uh, someone from the public could report a pothole somewhere and... Absolutely. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, they would just type in a pothole, type in the address, and it would automatically get populated in here. And it's for anything from potholes to loose dogs running loose to whatever. It's, it's endless what they could type in here. Do you guys have this on your cell phones? Uh, it the it's is works there an, is through, there an app for it or something? Or? Yes, it's all web-based, and it all works through uh, the iPad. It, it won't work on the phone, but it will work on iPad. So a lot of the information that you're going to see populated in here was us taking the iPads out in the trucks with us, recording data, whether it be pictures, measurements, uh, geolocations, things like that, so that we know where each and every asset's at and, and what it is. So when you're out there and take a picture with your iPad, you can upload it? Yes, sir. Right to this? I might be getting ahead of myself, but uh, how do you prioritize the tasks that go into there? I mean, if, you know, city staff put stuff in, public's putting stuff in, you guys are putting stuff in, who prioritizes that in the system? Uh, the system doesn't prioritize the request. It can prioritize uh, work based upon programmable parameters that we'll get into later. As far as just prioritizing the work that we're doing, that's all done in-house, If you know, depending on what it is and where it comes from. When you enter in the work asset, there's, there's a spot where you can prioritize it between one and five, and you know, five being something that needs to be done immediately, maybe it's a traffic hazard, something like that, and one just being normal day-to-day -day activities. We might be getting out of here pretty quick, folks. Who knows? <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Josh, I, I went to their website, and on there, I hope we never have to use it, but it, one of the good things about this, uh, this um, management system, it says that it can track dis disaster-related activities for documentation needed for um, uh, you know, recovery from the, from the federal government, like FEMA or whatever. You guys have that ability right with this? Yes, sir. Any work that we're doing now um, that requires any significant time or financial resources mm -hmm. is being tracked on Cartograph and all that data can be pulled uh, just by using this simple filter. Well, without aspect. documentation, you're not getting your money back. That's correct. Uh, yep. So now that we got this here, uh, Rick, if you could just slide this up. Here's our base map for the city of Holotus. Here's the list of <coughs> 11 requests that uh, we filtered out here. So these are all open requests that haven't been closed out. Uh, just a real quick overview of, of what these requests look like. Um, it gives you the issue. It tells you whether it's open or closed. It tells you whether or not it's been assigned to somebody and it tells you whether or not it's complete. And I left some of these complete ones in here just so we can kind of look and see the difference. Um, if you would, uh, Rick, click on the where is that? 
building uh, grounds maintenance request, please, right here. Sorry about that. You need to slide over, and there should be a view button somewhere right here. Right there. So this is a request that was put in today. It was requested by uh, Rick Schroeder, our city administrator, who most of our requests come from, in case you're wondering. Uh, <laughs> what, you, what you see in this request is basically a map where the request is pinned on here, a picture of the issue if it was uploaded, and any information regarding it, address, location, uh, what it falls under. If you could uh, scroll down, please, sir. A little bit further, right there. So here's the section that if somebody was to put any type of request, this is what you would see. And uh, here it's asking us to replace the exterior lights in front of City Hall because they're not functioning. It kind of gives a brief overview that they've already been ordered and when they get here, we'll install them. What you do with this request is this next key section here, the, the task. So you would create a work task tied to this, which is our next section. So if we could go to work task. So once any type of request has been put in, you see work task. This is the main part of the website that we use. This is where all the work is at. As you can see right now, we have 62 uh, planned work tasks. And if this is not full of work tasks to do, uh, we either run out of work or someone's not doing their job in putting it, right? So this should always be heavily populated. Um, if you would, once all this information is in here, if you would click on view on just any of those work tasks, this gets assigned to employees, whether it's myself or any of the other public works guys. And once they go do this work task, they have to come in here and populate all this data. And it, it literally takes about 30 seconds per work task. You just click on your material or your labor section here. You go in, put in whatever work you did, how long it took you and what materials you used. And it populates all this data. When I showed you that pie chart at the beginning, that was where the data goes, telling you how much money you spent and on what activities you've done. Uh, each activity can be different. Here we got, this is replace a street sign. So evidently there's a street sign uh, missing somewhere. If you look at the map, you see it's in front of the tractor supply here. And you should also be able to scroll down and see, if you click on this view, it gets a little more complicated, but it'll jump you to the next screen where it'll actually show you your asset. What an asset is, is basically described as um, any physical item that the department maintains. Within these assets, we have six different kinds. We have pavement, street signs, street markings, light fixtures, bridges, and a support function. So when you get to this asset, it's geolocated on a map, has a picture of the asset, it has information of the asset. Uh, it even brings up the, the MUTCD code for the sign, tells you what classification it is. And it gives you a very important number over here. This is called an estimated OCI. It stands for overall condition index. This condition index is based upon physical inspections of the asset or based upon a populated degradation curve that is running in the background of this system. Those degradation curves were built using uh, different uh, standards. We use some of them we got from the Texas A&M uh, traffic engineers, some of them we got from uh, Bear County, some of them we populated based upon manufacturer recommendations. So we took a lot of effort to make sure we built that curve right because this is a very key number as we'll see later on. Um, if you would scroll down, Rick, to uh, details. Just click there again. So what you get here is a picture of the sign, the shape of the sign, what it's doing. It's also key that it gives you the dimensions of the sign. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but we used to have a speed limit sign on one street be twice as big as a speed limit sign on the street uh, next door because we didn't have a standardized way of determining what size the sign was there before this. It was just put what you got and see how it goes. Another key uh, factor of this is we would, we would go into neighborhoods and there'd be an empty pole there. Well, what was on the pole? Well, we don't know. There's a thousand signs out there. Knowing what was on that pole, we don't know. So sometimes we would just take the pole off and not 
uh, use it for anything. Uh, so it's one of the key things that we're doing. We're actually tracking our assets. So anything that's out there in the field that we maintain is considered an asset. Did y'all enter all that stuff manually or did Cartograph do it when they the, ran through the streets? The only thing Cart Cartograph entered was the streets, which is what our biggest asset. And I don't know if you remember a while back when we had the van come out and do the laser surveying and the right. measurements. So they actually did all the streets for us, dimensions, scoring, uh, potholes and cracking, and they came up with this OCI number. For uh, pavement? For pavement only. For the rest of the items and assets, that was all done in-house and okay. done based upon inspections that we went and did on each one of these assets. Okay. Yeah, so if you if you go right here, I don't mean to go ahead. cut in, uh, but under bridges, we're actually classifying bridges as either bridges or culverts, um, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but they physically counted 121 bridges and culverts, took pictures of them, geolocated them on a map. Uh, light fixtures, uh, those are the mainly the lights that we have in the parking lot here or the lights that we have in Old Town, 31. Um, they measured and um, to the square, to the linear foot, uh, pavement markings on the street on all the roads that we have. So we have 339 individual markings. This isn't footage, these are individual assets. Um, pavement, we have 84 individual assets. Um, those are continuous streets. So it may look like a no num low number, but like Circle A is an extremely long street. Um, so we have 84. And these pavement numbers, by the way, are not private neighborhoods. These are just the public streets that the city maintains. We have, if I'm correct, we have the documentation on the private streets, but they are not counted as an asset. Am I correct in that? Uh, that's correct. If you okay. would uh, click on this asset portion of the map. Hold on just one second. I'm not okay, you. go ahead. Um, pavement areas are going to be um, like intersections, okay? Because that's not technically a street, it's an intersection. Uh, what I'll give them the biggest kudos on, if you look at signs, you see 962 signs in the city of Holotus. So they physically counted and okay. photographed and inputted all 962 signs, which I think is quite an accomplishment. Uh, Josh, cover your ears. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, I'll go back and take the lead. So if you would, uh, if you would click on that again, and it'll get you to the assets homepage right there. <laughs> what you see here is the check marks kind of going over what Rick was saying, and you see how this page correlates back to the homepage where he had that summary. Here it is uh, in real life form. So you see that there's 222 pavement sections. Those sections are block to block, right? So it's not just one street. Uh, the supports is the one that's empty. We haven't quite utilized that yet. We don't really know what we're going to utilize it for. Uh, when we purchased the module, it came with six asset tracking capabilities, and uh, we've only utilized five of them at this point. We're s so we got a little room to grow uh, in this module. There's your signs, and it gives you your total. And what you could do here is, like we built the first filter for the, for the uh, request section, you can find out all kinds of information about these assets. Uh, everything from the score to the distance to the parameters to where they're at, uh, just by building a small filter over here. And one of the things I wanted to show you, Rick, if you could type in this ID, type in uh, 260552 for me. 260552. No records, huh? All right, well that worked earlier. How about Liz, this is go click on Mesquite Flat. Can you find it on the map? <coughs> right about there, I think. This one or this one? Oh, uh, this section right here. Probably the reason why I didn't pull up is because we have all assets co collected and it's a lot of data. 206552. There we go. <laughs> I'm dyslexic, okay. If you just click on view. This is a typical street section, block to block. I uh, wanted to go over this to kind of show you the, the key number, the overall condition index. As you can see, we got a photo of the street. We got the outline of the street over the map. If you want to click on task, you can go actually go see if there's any work assigned to this street. And it gives you your history. So as we use this system more in the future, we'll be able to know what streets we're spending the most money on and, and why, because we'll see what task we're completing. 
What you see here is the install task, the inspection task, which were completed by Cartograph. And here's a planned work order that we have for that street. Uh, there was a report of some weeds growing through our asphalt, so we've now planned to go out there and do some weed kill in the road to maintain the integrity of it. Uh, so all these tie back one, one to another. Work being while the work's done, requests coming from the public are in, in staff, and assets are actually where you go to look at items in the field that we're doing the work on. The next section is real easy. It's the resources area. This is basically a rundown of all the materials that we use here in the city from sacks of concrete to poles for street signs to brackets. And as we order some in, we populate this and as the guys fill in these work tasks and say I put up a stop sign here and I use two brackets, it'll delete it from here. So we always have a, a running inventory. And that serves two purposes. One, we don't want a bunch of stuff laying around that we're not using, that we paid for, it's a waste of money. And two, we don't want to get caught empty handed uh, with things like stop signs because uh, they're, they're pretty key to people's safety. So that's pretty much what the resources is. And, the and we're also tracking exactly how much each one of those units cost. Yes, correct. Uh, if you would click on uh, resource 58, it's an example that I had, or just type 58. Either one's good. So the information uh, tells you how many you got on hand, what the value of it is. This is just how they're ordered one at a time. And if you scroll down, it shows you where you get your cost and your vendor for purchasing this. So this is the vendor we've been using in the past. This is what he's charging us per poll. You factor that in and that's where you get your price. And as you do your work orders, all those numbers updates itself. Uh, the last section is the report section. This section is a pre-populated report that came with the Cortograph system. Currently, uh, we're working on building a more acceptable report to provide to council on a monthly basis. Uh, but if you've seen the past couple of months, if you would click here for me, Rick, on the task performance measures. And uh, what you get is a date code. So we'll just put in for the month of August. So just August 1st, the end of August, and run the report. And what this is doing is it's taking all the tasks that we've done for the month of August and giving you a rundown of it. And we've been turning this into council, but the information is kind of not real user friendly, so we're working on it. But what you see here is for the month of August, the Public Works Department completed 313 work tasks. Uh, our average time to completion, I'm not sure what estimated accuracy is or where it comes from. If you scroll down, you'll see the work task, you'll see the dates they were performed, uh, what we did on whether it was an asset, whether it was a non-asset work task, and things like that. So we're working on making this report better uh, for you guys and for the public. And also, these, these expenses include labor. Correct. So this system is calculating how much the labor costs are, how much the equipment costs are, how much the um, uh, individual pieces of equipment that uh, uh, we're using, like a sign pole or something. So it's tracking as much as we can possibly track um, day to day. What, what you got here is the list of most expensive. So the most expensive thing we did for August is Mo, and it gives you your cost. If you see this task ID number, we can simply type in that task ID number. If you want to do that, Rick, that'd be Great. good. 1484, right up there. And here it is. This is a completed task with everything populated. Gives you your total cost, how many hours we spent on it, the labor, and what the equipment cost was for that. If we had bought any other material, like say we had damaged the equipment or something, <coughs> and we had to take it into the shop, that would also be tracked in here. If you wanted to see details, who worked on it and what equipment was used, you simply just click on one of those. That's your details, so that tells you what you're doing and the days it was completed. As the guys go in, because it takes multiple days to do this type of work, they say we did Beverly Hills and Altaloma on this date, we did Paragon on this date, so now we, we know exactly what date and where we were on that date. And uh, down here's your labor log, so you can see all the, the, the all of us, right, the whole department, all three of us worked on this at some point uh, for different numbers of hours. And we've used the John Deere tractor and zero tone roller and trailers and whatever. All these rates are based upon FEMA standards. So the way we came up with these dollar rates for our equipment was as we pulled the FEMA list to see what FEMA would reimburse us for. 
if we use the John Deere mower, if we use a zero turn mower, if we use a flatbed trailer, and we populated those hourly rates in here. So those are not just uh, willy nilly numbers, those are federal based costs. That's not the lawn guys, that's us. That's us. We, it's us. we okay. yes. regular right away. Okay. You know, we, three times a year we mow our regular right away. It's not part of the maintenance contract. Oh, okay. So, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so that's the main aspect of this. Now, earlier I mentioned the multi year budget forecasting and maintenance programs, and this is the last thing I'll go over real quick. Rick, if you could click on the shield, please, and go to our uh, scenario builder. I built this scenario. It's based upon street markings. The reason I chose street markings and not pavement is because we still don't have a lot of the data populated for pavement, such as maintenance methods and cost. But uh, street marking is relatively simple. If you would go right here and click on the view. And I'll just well, give you. Well, since are you going to go over the IDIQ? I wasn't. I thought that wasn't really. Well, no, that's fine. Feel so, free. so he was talking about how we don't have a lot of the data for the pavement yet. We have all the data about the condition of the pavement. But what we're doing right now is we will be going out for a bid called IDIQ, which is indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity bid. So we will be bidding out every type of activity that you can physically touch a street with, whether you're overlaying it, whether you're crack filling it, whether you're slurry sealing it, all that kind of stuff. And we will, we will be going out for bid that will give you a per square yard, per linear foot cost from a variety of different contractors. That's why they call it indefinite quantity, indefinite delivery, because we're not bidding a job, we're bidding a per unit cost, if that makes sense. And so once we get that data, we will be able to put it into the scenario builder and be able to pull the data on how much something will cost, and it'll, it can prioritize it a million different ways. Um, so that, that should be happening within the next month. So since we're not using this to actually physically fix the roads, we can't use our new street maintenance tax money for this, can we? We are using street maintenance on this, yes. Are you? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, That's this, great. This I didn't is think they would let you do that. So this is part of it then. We can use is, it for that this. That is correct. Well, it's very limited in what you can use it for, um, and I am considering yeah, this the is fact that the this is directly related to street maintenance as an allowable cost. Well, good. Okay. And this is also how we'll make sure we're sp when they ask us where do you spend the money, here it is. Uh, real quick, this is going to be a, a general overview of Scenario Builder. So we went through the work, the assets, the resources, and the reporting. This is basically all four of those wrapped into one. So if you could just click on the four, the view. I've already ran this review, so the numbers are already populated. But what we did was, is we ran a report based upon our overall condition index for all street markings in the city. We have an average score. All these markings are scored from one to 100, so an average score is a 50. So when we populated this, we told this report, I want to include every street marking, every piece of paint on the road that scored less than a 50 in this scenario. <coughs> what you see here is how many assets it actually uh, factored into it. It gives you a starting score. So if you take all of our street markings that scored less than a 50, the average OCI is a 27. When I built this report, I said my ultimate goal is to get all street markings up to that 50 or better so that they meet, the, meet that average. Um, so it's an overall condition index based report. Uh, there's no financials in here. The only financials in this report is how much it costs per linear foot to paint. And then it factors that in by how many linear feet you have to paint. Um, so I believe we calculated up, it was slightly over 30 miles of paint on the street is what we're maintaining right now. So you run that scenario based upon 30 miles, and then you program how many years you want it to run for. This is a five-year plan, so our ultimate goal is if we were to implement this report was say in five years for the asset of street markings, every street marking in the city would be scored above average according to this report if we were able to implement this dollar amount. If you hover over these bars here, here's your one, two, three, four, and five years amount, and it tells you first year spend this, second year that, and so on and so forth, and it gives you this huge overall number. What's also good about this report is if you go down to activities, 
it gives you a year by year place of where to go repaint. It will give you the asset ID number, tells you to repaint it, tells you what that asset's gonna cost you, and tells you what the OCI impact is gonna be by painting that. So by painting this one asset, you're gonna increase your condition index of the asset by 38 points. And it just lists all those. You can see there's 399 work activities. So what this report's basically tell you, if we can do these at work activities within five years, spend this money, will increase our condition of our asset by 50, up to 52, which is above average. We can do this for streets. That's the main point, the main reason we went to this. The difference between repaint and streets is streets is gonna give you six or seven different maintenance options when you run this report, whereas street markings, there's really only one way to fix them, repaint them. So which is why this was a lot easier report to build in a lot shorter amount of time. And uh, we can set that maintenance plan to be based upon budget or you can be based upon your overall condition index, whatever uh, we see fit at the time when we get to that point. And that's pretty much it. Um, I imagine there's gotta be at least one question. So I have go. two. Let, let me just uh, real quickly, can you pull up, uh, I, I mentioned some intersections and you were able to pull up the sign sure. there. Could could y'all, why don't you mention an intersection and let's see I if do. they can pull up. Can I do it? Huh? You want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Riggs and 1560, the stop sign. That is actually not going to be included in here because that is text dot. That thing gets knocked right. down every other day. <laughs> yeah, but it's not. It's got to be costing them a That's fortune. That's text dot. Okay, sorry. You, you want to pick an intersection and we'll see what. Uh, Circle A Trail and Bar X Trail. Okay. <clears throat> you wanted to see the pavement section or the sign or both? Whatever he wanted to I'd see. I'd like to see, just show him what the sign, the picture of the sign looks like, just as. So what Rick could do is just go to assets here. <clears throat> and just uncheck all these boxes, except for signs. I, I know where it is, so I'm not. You'll be able to find it? Okay. Sometimes when you have too many filters on, it'll all overlap. You said you wanted the stop sign? At Bar X? Whatever signs there. A, it, it should be a stop sign. There's so a, this is a... I don't think there's a stop sign there. This is a guide sign. If there is, I don't know where it is. If you would scroll down. So basically, it's a street name sign. So this is a street name. And if you go to the notes section, it'll tell you what street this is. It's either going to be Circle A or... There it is, Rockingham Trail. So it's the Rockingham Trail sign. If you would scroll all the way to this attached files section... <coughs> Go ahead and click right there. So hmm. there it gives you a clear picture of the sign. And that helps us determine what color assigned to order, right? You don't want different signs. And then it in that other area, it gives you your dimension, your size, your location. And it'll also tell you, give you that, that condition index of the rating of that sign. And one thing we didn't really cover is we the, the curves for those signs are what's going to key us to replace them. So we have a life expectancy for a sign that's made out of the high intensity prismatic uh, sheeting. And that curve is built in here. So when this reaches uh, a below average score, it'll automatically prompt the system to create a work task assigned to me uh, to go ahead and get that sign replaced. Uh, we can also run a scenario on these signs just like we did for street markings. So we'll be able to budget year by year a certain dollar amount to replace signs so that we never get caught having to do a large replacement at one time. And this right here is a work in progress because if you looked at that file, you can see that that sign is, is not, whoa, it's not new. Um, mm -hmm. It's however many years ago that where they were at, we were actually replacing this sign. So it's probably at least 10 years old, perhaps. And, and what it did is when we went out and actually took that picture and installed the sign into Cartograph, that was its install date. So the system saying, hey, this is a brand new sign. The difference between signs and street markings and pavement is the pavement and street markings, we've gone out and done an inspection and scored it, whether it was us on the markings or Cartograph on the streets. Uh, due to the sheer number of signs, we did not go out and do a inspection on every sign. We do plan on doing that in the future, but uh, we're still in our infancy with the program. And we have, we have a life expectancy for, a for this type of high intensity of six years on here. 
which is why it here it says five years and eight months left. That's because they inputted it about four months ago. Um, so once they install, over the course of six years, this system for signage will start to work better, if that makes sense, because you'll actually have a correct install date. We just don't know when those signs were installed. Rick, could you go down to the attachments? And this is what I thought was so interesting was mm -hmm. watching these guys input this all this there stuff be, uh, and being out in the field and taking all the pictures. There should be a little icon pop. There you go. Click on that. You had almost a thousand signs, as I recall you saying, and so they're they're all pretty much in here, right? Nine hundred and sixty-nine, I believe. Yeah. So so now when you install a new sign, whether it's a street name sign or a stop sign, yield sign you're putting that date in here and that starts the clock on the six years or whatever. Did you, um, and I will was, tell you that's going to go. There was actually a poll, a, a poll there with nothing on it. I remember when y'all took it down, I was really glad that y'all did because it was <laughs> yeah. just there. And we didn't know what was on there before. Yeah, who knows what was on there. I will say this number will go over a thousand uh, with the addition of the new neighborhood off of GOM. None of that's been recorded yet. Yeah. So. Okay. You had a question? Yeah, I had two. Um, although you probably made me forget them. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, okay. It could um, be a good thing. <laughs> so, if if a citizen calls uh, to say there's a pothole on my street, do you direct them to go and fill this form out? Um, depend. No, most of the time I fill it out for them. I don't want to force them to um, go. Yeah, so I don't want to. I don't want to force them to go back. But sometimes they'll report it to Felicia, and she can input it uh, when they come into the front and do something in writing, or they call me and I'll input it. Or if they want to, they can go online and do it. But most of the time, we do it. Okay, just so you to don't prevent. force them to go and do that because mm -hmm. a lot of some, especially the elderly people, don't mm -hmm. really. You know, well, get and as we get more into it, we'll make it more well known that they can do that. Right. And then. Uh, and you, you know, can actually give them the option. You know, sure. you can do this online, or y'all will take it now. Sure. Yeah. The other, my other comment is this on is streets. Um, Who's responsible, like, uh, for example, I, I was just, funny that you brought this up about the streets. On our, uh, There's a street that I walk my dogs on, and there's some, some company is putting a new, or adding more concrete for a driveway, and I notice big chunks of our street, of the street right in front of it, are, are, have been ripped out. So who's responsible for that? The company who obviously did it, or the city? That, that goes through development service. They should be building that to the same standard it is when they got there. So if they mess it up, they should put it back I'll the way it was. It. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. One of the things that this is helping us do that we really didn't cover is we, we for the longest time, we didn't have an updated index of our streets. So uh, years ago, the engineer went out and gave every street a score. So when a developer would come into the city and pull a permit to do an excavation on that street, that's the score we were using to tell them when you repair this, it has to be repaired to this condition. Well, now that we have this updated information and it'll continue to update, we can use that to say, no, we know our street was scored above whatever right. the number may be, so that's what you need to repair it to. Okay. Anything else? And this, by the way, is what the uh, resident would look at. They can select, when they go to the public works page, they can select a variety of things, whether it's animal control, code enforcement, uh, public works stuff and that gets routed to um, various individuals when it comes in. But it's always, once it goes in as a request, it's always in there unless you, um, uh, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's always in the system and tracked is what I'm trying to say. I think we can delete it if we, if we want to, is that correct? Yes. Um, but all requests then turn into to tasks anyway, so. It's very hard to delete because it won't delete connected files. So if someone does a, re does a request and then we do a work order and then we upload a picture and then we say what we did to it, you have to start at the end of the tail and work hard the way back to get it deleted. So more than likely everything that is ever inputted in there will remain in there. Well, and hopefully you guys see how it's a sophisticated deal and we're getting to a point where uh, we can really keep up with, with what needs to be done in the city and the condition of all of our stuff. Ed, do you have any questions? So you're tracking hours. I noticed like on the machinery used, mm -hmm. is, are you going to use that to kind of adjust the estimated useful or remaining life of the asset, like the, perhaps a tractor, things like that, so that you can figure the, the cost of a new tractor into the budget for the subsequent year? Yes. It, words, you could say that. It's yeah, it's tracking. It's tracking. The, when we inputted all of the equipment that we had, for example, a Bobcat, we're, we're, we're 
uh, tracking that by hours. So we will know how many hours that equipment is in operation. Um, for a vehicle, we're tracking that in miles. I, are we tracking <coughs> that in hours or miles? Miles, correct? It's actually tracked both ways. Miles I'll, and hours. Oh, okay. Uh, miles and hours. So depending on the type of equipment that we're using, we are tracking when the guys go in at the end of the day and said, I use this equipment for five hours, um, it's automatically logged and attached to that piece of equipment. So yes, we can use that to justify replacing the equipment uh, if necessary. Yeah. All right, thanks. Anything else? No. no. Alex? Yes, I had a question. You said it was to basically to track all the things that you guys maintain, so it obviously isn't going to uh, deal with anything like city hall or equipment, police, fire department, and all that, but I presume it would be tracking then things such as the, uh, the disc golf course, the picnic tables out there and that sort of thing. I, I didn't see any reference to that, but sure. fencing around here or that kind of thing mm -hmm. would eventually be added in there as well, again, to maintain and to keep up. I, I didn't really go over it, but yes, it will. It, it basically tracks all work that we do that's worth recording, right? We're not going to record. I drove over here for five minutes and came back, but if it involves us mobilizing, going there, field and do work, even if it's not one of the six assets, there's a whole other section in there called a non-asset. So basically on a non-asset, we can tie that to anything. Anything that we do, whether it be run an errand for the city, go drop off a car to get an inspection. If we wanted to record that, we would simply record it as a non-asset and we would be able to look up, based upon the filters that I showed you, uh, you could look up filter grounds maintenance and see everything that we've done that was done not to an asset, which would be most everything at City Hall or a park or things like that. And we already are tracking that. So if these guys get requests internally to replace a light bulb or to replace anything, it goes in and is a non-asset task and or other, and uh, it's tracked in the system. Cool. Thank you the, for all the, the hard work you put into this. Yeah. The thing about the system, it's, it's growable. So they actually have a module. This is a transportation module which focuses on right-of-ways and things in right-of-ways. There's actually modules, if we ever get to that point, for building maintenance or for parks that you would simply just be the same user system and you would just get extra assets to do things on. But that, that, it's kind of complicated for changing light bulbs, in my opinion. <laughs> anything Thank else? You. Bert, anything? Paul? I, the only other thing I had was uh, when you track labor, uh, how do you all calculate yeah, the right. hourly rate? Is it just an average of all the employees in public works or no, it's, per, it's, it's, per, it's employee specific per employee. so we have their exact labor rates in the system their hourly rate so to say we have my rate we have Josh's rate we have everybody's rate in this okay and we update that in the <laughs> October <laughs> cycle so. okay fantastic thanks Cynthia anything else anybody any follow-up mm -hmm. Okay, Josh. Hey, good thank, job. Thank you very Thanks. much. Uh, if you ever want to play around with the system, feel free to come by the office and I'll log it on and you can look through there. <clears throat> well, we've come a long way in the last six months or so as far as being able to know what uh, needs to be done. Okay, next up is item 10. <clears throat> and we put this on the agenda, <clears throat> excuse me, because uh, I received this several weeks ago. It was just a, uh, uh, as you saw, a ballot uh, from Texas Municipal League for their Intergovernmental Risk Pool Board of Trustees election. And there were some vacancies uh, available, so I asked Rick if, if he'd be interested in uh, putting his name in the hat and he uh, said that he would. And so uh, they sent us this ballot. And if you notice on the cert certificate, the last page, uh, the only way we can send it in is by certifying that uh, it's the will of the majority of the governing body, which of course is you guys. So I went through here and, and, and I'll, I'll just tell you which ones I marked. And if you have a, something different you'd like to do, uh, is certainly your option, but on place six, I put uh, Mary Gower, the incumbent. Place seven, C.J. Wax, the incumbent. Place eight, uh, Andrea M. Gardner, the city manager of the city of Coppers Cove. And then of course in place nine, our very own city administrator, Rick Schroeder. 
And so uh, we would go ahead and, and this is labeled as discussion and action. So if uh, I can get a motion and a second to open it for discussion, then we'll look at uh, talking about the names and then take action on what you want to do. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we discuss and take action on item number <clears throat> 10 as written. We have a motion from Fredericks. Do we have a second? I second that. A second from Massey. <clears throat> so with a motion and a second, Paul, it's your motion. Uh, you have any any uh, input on candidates that you'd like to have? My uh, my X marks were the exact same as yours, so what? we're in agreement. Okay. Anything else? No, sir. Cynthia? No, I'm fine with the candidates chosen. Okay, Ed? I'm good with the candidates chosen too, thank you. Alex? Nothing, thank you. Bert? Didn't Rick run for this last year? No. No, that's Bear County Appraisal District. <laughs> I just hate to see you be a loser again, but anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and go with the. Uh, <laughs> this is actually a better shot than Bear County Appraisal. <laughs> Yeah, if you recall the other one, we only have what seven votes yeah. for, versus San Antonio with about fifty thousand. Yeah, so. yeah, that's, yeah. <clears throat> you ran a good it's, campaign. It's fair and equitable the way they figure the balloting, but uh, no, I'm good, okay, I'm good with the candidates. You're good with that. <clears throat> okay, if there's no further discussion, then we will go ahead and submit this uh, with place six, Mary Gower, place seven, C.J. Wax, place uh, eight. Andrea M. Gardner, and in place nine, our very own Rick A. Schroeder. So uh, if you're ready for the question, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. We'll submit the, uh, certify the ballot and get it mailed in to uh, Texas Municipal League. <coughs> Next up, we'll have an update from uh, Rick on the budget. Uh, there have been some, as you are well aware, as we go through the, the process, we'll have some changes in revenue numbers and expense numbers, and that's what Rick will cover. And then we will go to each one of you guys uh, for direction on uh, anything you want to discuss. Okay. Um, I uh, sent out to City Council the updated appendices or index numbers or tabs, whatever you want to call them. Um, and those are the portions of the budget that were basically touched or amended here. So everything that I'm not going over this evening uh, is the same as it was uh, when we presented the budget the first meeting in August. Um, under item number six or tab number six, you'll see that there were some revisions to Humana Medical and Humana Dental. Um, actually, the uh, Crandall and Associates went back to Humana and negotiated rates down. Um, so the revised renewal rate for um, health went from 369.71, which was a 13% increase, to 354 dollars and 89 cents, which is an 8.5% increase, uh, and that's keeping the exact same medical plan as we're offering uh, this current fiscal year. Under dental. This uh, does include a plan change. Um, the revised, if we would have kept, or, or if we're recommending keeping the uh, exact same plan as we have this year, the revised rental, weight, went, rental rate went, went from $23.33 to $24.77, or about a 6% increase. The alternate dental plan that Humana is now offering is actually a better plan uh, with very similar um, actually the same co-pays, but it's a better plan and it is cheaper. Um, so it's $22.01 uh, versus what we're currently paying, $23.33. So it's a better plan, covers more, covers higher percentages, uh, but it's cheaper. Those are the only two amendments that we made to the salary components within the budget, and those numbers have been incorporated in the general fund. Uh, in those revisions. Under tab number seven, tab number seven is the general fund. Um, and I'm going to go through uh, several of the numbers uh, in here, not individual ones, uh, but the large categories of revenues or expenditures. Um, so the fund balance at right now uh, has increased $267,564. 
uh, or the expected fund balance for next year. That is predominantly due to the over half a million dollars in, in revenue received from TxDOT or to be, uh, to be received from TxDOT for the uh, land acquisition. We expect that beginning fund balance to at least equal or be greater than the 519,000 uh, by the end of September. Um, so that we're not, it doesn't look as though we're, we're actually utilizing that money this fiscal year when in effect we're trying to use it for next fiscal year. The property taxes uh, remain the same. The non-property taxes uh, revenue increased approximately $56,000. Uh, <laughs> that is primarily related to sales tax. Franchise taxes increased by $3,900. Licenses and fees decreased by $33,000, that is again related to uh, lower than average building permit collections. Court fines uh, decreased by $36,000, that is related to lower uh, municipal court citation uh, fine collections. Melissa, mis miscellaneous revenue decreased by approximately $1,000. Fire department revenue increased by approximately $3,000 and designated revenues decreased by approximately $4,000. So total revenues overall decreased from, last, from the last iteration by about $17,000. Looking at expenditures, city council uh, expenditures increased by $300. Administrative, uh, and by the way, when I'm going through this, there were no new projects or new equipment or anything added to this list. Uh, that wasn't presented to you in the, at the last meeting. Um, this is just sheer fluctuation in revenues coming in and expenditures going out. Um, administration expenditures increased or are expected to increase by $13,000. That's primarily related to IT costs. Dispatch expenditures decreased by $500. City secretary expenditures decreased by $350. Municipal court expenditures decreased by approximately $20,000, again, related to court fee, court fees that we have to pay to the state, which is directly related to citations and revenues coming into municipal court. Human resources decreased by $600. Development services decreased by $800. Animal control public works increased by $3,000. This is primarily related to us equalizing street improvements and drainage improvements. Now I've been questioned on this, and I can't remember if I covered it at the last meeting, why have money in here for street improvements if we have a street maintenance sales tax fund. This is directly related to those things that we cannot use with the street maintenance money, i.e. signage, um, things of that sort. Uh, there's a whole litany of things, bollards, things like that, even though in my opinion they're directly related to the street the state says that we can't use them for that. Buildings and grounds increased by $10,000. As I was adjusting this, uh, revenues and expenditures, I tried to put money, if there was some extra money in there when it all balanced out, I tried to put money in the uh, line items that would affect all departments. So all, the far, par, all departments typically use the 550, whether it's building maintenance, uh, grounds maintenance, those sorts of things. So I lumped in the, the remaining $9,500 or $10,000 into that account or that uh, fund number. Police department uh, decreased by $10,900. Fire department decreased by $8,000. And EMS decreased by $2,400. So total expenditures again they match the revenue side. Those decreased by $17,200, which means revenues year over year, and excuse me, revenues year over year are nil. And so the total fund balance at the end of the year is expected, at the end of FY17, is expected to increase by $268,000. Again, that should be higher, should be projected to be higher at the end of this fiscal year due to additional revenues coming in and us preserving that five little over half a million dollars in the, into our fund balance. Under tab number eight, now I'm going to go through the individual funds. Tab number eight is debt service or interest in sinking. The beginning fund balance increased from the last iteration by $41,000. The uh, total revenues decreased or expected revenues uh, decreased by $643. 
and total expenditures decreased by $643. So the uh, ending fund balance at the end of next fiscal year, we're projecting $153,000 in there. Again, that money can be used for anything that is quote unquote debt. Um, so it could be used to pay off capital leases, i.e. the vehicles, it could be used to pay off litigation expenses, anything that is considered debt, it can be used for. Tab nine, tab nine is capital replacement. The beginning fund balance on ca the expected, and all these are expected by the way, I keep saying the beginning, but it's all expected for next year. That is expected to decrease by $110,000, assuming we continue to spend money of the capital fund bud budget this fiscal year, um, which may be highly unlikely. So that number is like liable to actually go up uh, towards the end of September. Total revenues decreased by $2,900, and total uh, expenditures decreased by $113,000 on all of the 0, 03 through 14 fund budgets, which is capital, um, street, uh, street maintenance, all of those types of funds. Again, I'm drawing these accounts down to zero when in practice we don't really do that on a year-to-year -year basis. It's just easier from a budgeting perspective to, to draw everything down to zero. At least it is in my perspective. Um, item number 10 is municipal court security and technology. The beginning fund balance decreased by 400 the revenues decreased by 600 or 700, and the uh, expenditures decreased by 1,100. You'll notice in the vast majority of these types of funds now, we're actually decreasing revenues and decreasing expected expenditures because uh, we either haven't received the revenue yet, uh, or we're really starting to not expect to receive any more revenue for the remainder of August or September. Uh, again, drawing that account down to zero. Technology, beginning fund balance uh, went up $275, total revenues went down $930, and the expenditures went down $655 uh, in that fund. PEG, PEG is what we can utilize for a public access channel and all of the equipment that's related to that, and by the way, I'm under item tab number 11, I'm sorry. Um, the beginning fund balance is expected, is projected to decrease from the last iteration by $3,400. Revenues declined by approximately $6,000 and expenditures declined by approximately $9,000. Uh, again, there is a large number of expenditures in here. Let's see. We're estimating about $136,000 in expenditures. Don't anticipate any real costly expenditures. Um, but as in years past, I budgeted that fund down to zero. Tab 12 is police training. The beginning fund balance uh, this time has gone down $244 and revenues have decreased 200, approximately $200 and the expenditures have actually increased by $17. The, that fund is drawn down to zero as well. School safety, school safety, uh, which is tab number 13. Uh, De the beginning fund balance decreased by $1,300, revenues decreased by $1,600, and expenditures decreased by $2,900. Tab 14, there were no changes to tab 14 or tab 15, which is the explore post, which really the fund is closed, so you, after this fiscal year, you'll never see that fund again, fund 13. Um, and Forfeiture state and forfeiture federal money, PD money, those funds are dormant because there's literally no money uh, in those. So there were no changes to any of those funds. Street maintenance, uh, the beginning fund balance has increased by $25,000 uh, and that's related to us not spending what we have projected to spend this year. Um, and total revenues remain the same Total expenditures increased by $25,306. So overall, next year, we're in we could have, we have the potential to spend $378,000 in street maintenance uh, citywide. Um, and again, that, that draws that fund down to zero. I wanna go back to that IDIQ that we were talking about. The, the way that IDIQ works is basically 
I, I've already gone over the unit pricing and all of that. But you, within that, we are estimating that we're going to spend about $250,000 a year in street maintenance expenditures. Because if you recall, when we originally adopted, I think we were anticipating about $270,000 uh, based upon current sales tax that was coming into the city. So we're trying to be a little bit more conservative and say, hey, we're guys, construction guys, we're going to spend $250,000, bid on a lump sum of $250,000 and give us the best per square foot, per square yard, per linear foot price you can, given that we're going to spend that amount of money. Um, so we are well over the projected um, expenditures here, which I don't necessarily want, and I think the mayor would agree, I don't want to draw that fund down to zero. I want to keep having some residual so that it builds some, some money over time so that we can tackle some of the larger projects as well. The $377,000 when you're looking at redoing an entire street, that really is not a lot of money. Now, when you're talking about maintenance, and compared to what we've done in the past, that is a lot of money. Um, so uh, that is why we are bidding out $250,000 worth of work, but we're actually projecting that we could spend $377,000 if we needed to. Yes, sir. Yeah, you said uh, we were over our expected expenses. You meant revenue, correct? On that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. The last tab is tab 17, uh, the municipal fee schedule, and there were no changes to that. That is still proposed at a 1% increase across the board. Uh, in years past, we have not done, well, we haven't adjusted really the, the fee schedule since 2014. Um, in years past, we have not recommended increasing the building permit fees or the plan review uh, fees. Um, in this fee schedule, it does across the board increase everything by 1%, which for the most part is really pennies, five, 10 cents uh, on some of the smaller um, fees. Are there any questions? Or uh, Alex, uh, let's start with you on, on questions and discussion. I guess if you're I, ready. You ready? Yes. Okay. I guess my only question was I know we have some of the funds that, that we've talked about in, in years past, the, the PEG fund and the school safety fund, and I, I know that the balance is grow on those because we're limited in what we can spend them for. <coughs> Have we worked towards being more creative, and especially I'm thinking of, of the, <coughs> the public access fund. Is there anything else we could do that might utilize those funds for something that might benefit the city? I, I don't know. Are, are there well, let me, let, like me, let me tackle the street, the, I mean the school safety first. Uh, we are utilizing it. It's projected in here to use about 40 something thousand dollars next fiscal year for uh, the sidewalk from O'Connor entrance to um, could go, depending on bids, could go to Starbucks, but most likely will go to the Taco Bell. Um, so we are using, trying to use that money and fit it in where we can so that's just not sitting there. Um, and the vast majority of it, I think, will probably be spent on that sidewalk project. PEG is a little bit more challenging. Um, I would say with PEG, one of the things that, that I would be looking for next year, and I thought about it today, as a matter of fact, which is an interesting question, um, Grace has oftentimes complained about the, the camera system itself. It's, it operates on a remote control, if you will. So right now on all the videos, you'll see that we kind of leave it on the entire dais because it's not very user friendly and zooming in when somebody's speaking, which would also uh, fix the clarity issue somewhat uh, because you're zooming in on somebody that is speaking rather than just panning the entire dais. Um, so that is something that I would like to look at for next year. Um, but beyond that, uh, perhaps we can look at lighting, a little bit better lighting in here so that it's easier for the public to see uh, via the video and, and on public access. Um, there could be some modifications to the audio system, but I, we really can't use it for anything other than public access channel related. I mean, we could use it to hire somebody to come in and videotape and live broadcast that's probably going to eat up a lot of our money. Um, so the other thing that I was thinking about we could use it for is on more controversial issues, sometimes, and it happens so infrequently, I'm not even sure if it's worth it, but sometimes we have the press here. They do make plug-ins for the press to where they can actually plug into our sound system um, and be able to, to 
digitally record that so it sounds better than just them having a camera feed. That's one of the things that I was thinking about we could do in the back uh, of City Hall. But those, it, it kind of is what it is uh, with that. We just keep generating the money um, and don't really at this point have a lot to spend it on. Now I will say in a couple years when our system starts <coughs> phasing out, we're going to have to replace that and that's going to be another thirty to forty thousand uh, dollar price at that point because we would have to replace all the equipment but we're it, the equipment is working fine generally uh, right now so. yeah, we, we spent a lot of money this this last year just on the the audio stuff mm -hmm. and it's it's much much better than the old but uh, it's like everything else like Rick was just saying uh, all of this equipment especially on the rack in the back uh, has a, a, li a lifespan before it becomes obsolete or can't be serviced anymore so we have to have a, re a reserve if you will in there to be able to purchase that new equipment but the camera and everything is fairly new well i wasn't i wasn't trying to figure out how to spend it all to zero i, I know no, I understand. we have to do that yeah. i was just thinking if there's any way that that in the whole idea of public access if it was strictly limited to that channel it is strictly or, limited to that channel i was yeah. thinking maybe it would be something that could be used on the sign because that is access to the public from the city's perspective and whether or not we could do something with regard to the uh, sign out front or that kind of okay, so access the, because mm -hmm. it is to the public the, the other question i guess was as you kind of alluded to maybe the production of something that would go on the channel other than just being a static image for a lot of time um, and i didn't know whether or not that was was an option as far as I don't know, I'm just thinking off yeah the I mean we, we certainly we certainly can use it to hire uh, an individual uh, that sole purpose would be used to create content and better inform the public out there right now we're basically it's basically kind of like a PowerPoint system okay we create the slides we update it and then it just broadcasts via time word cable so yes we could look at hiring uh, most probably not a full timer, but probably a sub consultant or or an independent firm that would kind of manage that stuff for us. We could. Um, it also depends on the type of season. Like right now, we're in on on public access. The mayor just asked me about that today. What do we have on the public access channel? Well, right now we really just have stuff about movie night <laughs> because we have one more movie uh, and we have marketplace stuff on there. I mean, there's some stuff about the community band, uh, but that's, I don't want to use the term filler, but it's, it's not date specific, if that makes sense. It's not an upcoming event. So it depends on the type of year, too, what, what the city has going on. The other thing that we have on there right now is, is our tax notice. We're required, because we have a public access channel now, to, to post the tax, the proposed tax rates and things like that. So, the, but we can look into that. I mean, I hadn't, honestly hadn't thought about that, and I think that, could be a good idea depending on how much that would cost. But one of the things that I would like to do is focus for sure on making it more user friendly to have a nicer looking video that's really sort of a touch screen. You kind of, if you start talking, you touch it and it automatically goes to you versus us having to hold a remote kind of cattywampus at that thing and try to make it turn. It's so. not like flying a drone. Yes. Yeah. But the reason uh, it, it has to be restricted to this is the revenue is coming from Time Warner Cable, so it has to all go back to that channel. Okay, all right. That, that was, was my question. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, Paul, you want to go next? Uh, we had a little discussion about vehicles uh, earlier. What is the uh, life expectancy on, on a police vehicle? Is it, is it, I mean, I know they, they were trying to place them at 100,000 miles or 120. Is that three, four years, five years? Four. Typically four years. Mm -hmm. And what's the lease life? Uh, what's the, the length of the lease? Four so years. Four. So once the lease is up, they really kind of just, they're ready to go and. Pretty much. We buy, we buy the whole package for a dollar at the end of the lease. And when we first started into this, that was the idea was figuring 25,000 miles on patrol annually, which is about historically what it was. That, that's how we came up with the four years. Okay. And, has and again, I think that's an average or an estimate. I mean, it really much, depends yeah. on how much I they... I mean, it's not going to... It doesn't mean we're going to hit 100,000 right. miles, right. but we're going to be fairly close. So, I, I guess one of the questions becomes is if you have more vehicles, can and, you spread and, that mileage out to 
you know, as opposed to having five police cars, we have six or seven. I mean, that's a, it's a, a cost of the lease, but can you spread those miles out? Um, and so the cars are lasting five years instead of four. That's, that's what we're looking at, at doing this time. I talked to the chief about it and keeping one or two of those um, older cars as a reserve car to use while something else is in the shop perhaps. So hopefully that answers your question. We are gonna have a couple of the older cars, but they'll be reserve cars. Yeah, and I think, I think that's commonsensical. The more vehicles we have, the less we're gonna utilize them. Yeah, right. Um, but I don't think, for, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that that's our approach here. I think that we're, we're not trying to ask for additional vehicles because we want to no. utilize some less than others. We're just trying to replace them as, as quickly as we can when they hit 100,000 miles. Because some of the vehicles are over 100,000 miles and have quite a bit of maintenance costs right now. The other thing that I think that is important in answer to your question is those vehicles we don't sell. A lot of them we don't sell. We recycle into other departments, predominantly my departments. Um, so for example, warrants or uh, code enforcement, uh, animal control, those um, actually, all of those departments have recycled vehicles uh, from either the fire department or the police department because uh, it's not as mission critical, if you will, uh, that those vehicles operate consistently on a 24-7 basis as it is for fire and EMS and for police. But that, that's my point is if, if we did four this year and we did a couple other ones next year, would that spread the life expectancy out? That, that, I guess that's my point is, it, is the cost benefit there to do four this year and maybe two next year to spread that life out a little bit more? Would that be more cost effective? I guess that's the question. Has anybody looked into that to see if that's cost effective? Well, to went into this, each year we've purchased vehicles. So in theory, each year, four years is gonna be up on whatever okay. we bought four years ago. So it's gonna to work to where, uh, when we started out, each year we'll, we'll be replacing some. And so we'll always have a fairly current fleet. Okay. But okay. we did decide if, if a vehicle is still viable and isn't costing us a lot of maintenance and we don't need it somewhere else, we'll keep it in PD because uh, as four or five months ago, we had two of our vehicles in the shop uh, for major maintenance. And so we were down, we, everything was fine, but it was just to keep that from happening, okay. keep, keep more current. I was just wondering if, that, if we looked at that. If, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. That's all. Thank you. Cynthia, anything? Yes. Um, I was trying to find, um, both on the EDC budget and on our budget, where a pedestrian bridge would be located. The pedestrian bridge will be under the uh, capital fund. Uh, so it's going to be under fund 03. Um, and right now... The general budget? No, not on the general fund. It'll be in the capital fund. So that's going to be under... Well, nine says capital replacement and fund, fund budget. Is that yes, the one you're talking yes, about? Yes, that is correct. So there's a little over $3 million. Uh, actually, there's there's money in there that are, well, here, let me just move to it. There's 3289. The beginning fund balance is 3289. Yes, yeah, so you can see under the last page of the revised capital fund budget, um, there is city 2015 CFO expenditures of $3.3 million right. in there. That does not include, and I uh, was specific with the EDC about this, the EDC has essentially spent its, its allotment of the 2015 CFOs. That includes money that we spent to, or that we have, um, well, that we s spent and wrote a check to TxDOT for administrative fees of the Holotus Creek Linear Park, uh, approximately $312,000. We are anticipating a refund of the 300 and of a portion. We don't know yet what that portion is of the 312,000. And so once we receive that and reconcile that, we can then go ahead and amend the EDC's capital budget and the city's capital budget at that point. But I do not know when we will receive that money back. And that money will go towards, it's my understanding, um, that that money will go towards the pedestrian bridge in Old Town. And if you recall, the estimated administrative fees that TxDOT said they spent was around 64,000. So we're anticipating getting back 
from the 312, somewhere between 240 and 250,000, but we don't have a firm number yet. And we will contest the $64,000. Okay. Right. So that's where it would come out of. It just, okay. Yes, so. But it would be, I guess I've always been confused. Is this going to be the city money paying for it or EDC funds? Well, it, it really could go, well, let me back up here. What I, what I was trying to say is the city, the EDC has spent its money. It's actually spent more than it was originally allotted. Uh, because of mon monies that it had to spend on water and sewer to LNV. So there's still some reconciliation that needs to occur between city capital money and EDC capital money over the next month and a half before we finally adopt this thing. Uh, and we have not done that yet. Um, knowing full well that that's not answering your question though. The, I guess my original response would be that since the EDC is paying the debt service that it'd be, it'd probably go back into the EDC fund or into uh, 03550 since they are paying for that. But anything that they're going to have to do is still going to have to be approved by council. So that's why I'm struggling with this because it's really all just city money anyway. Well, yeah, it's, it's a little fuzzy. The EDC has requested paying for it or, or expressed an interest in paying for it, but it really depends on how we assign the dollars that are coming back from that administrative fee, whether it goes to the EDC or the city, so one way or another. We're working on the project. Okay, but we don't have to specifically put it in our budget that this is what we're going to spend, that we would want to put the pedestrian bridge out, or do we? Well, that was actually included in the uh, 2015 <coughs> CFO issuance. You specifically said these are the things that we're spending the money on, whether it be the FM 1560 bridge, the realignment project, the Holotus Creek Linear Park, of which the pedestrian bridge was a part of. Okay. So I think it's already covered in the CFO issuance. Okay. Um, the other thing I'm is sorry about that answer. It's, it's just a, it's a cloudy answer, yeah, I realize. Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. It's a little more, it's less cloudy than it was, but it's still <laughs> um, I was looking at you, raising all of the fees by 1%. 1% rounded to the nearest quarter. And, and I'm, I'm having a, you know, and I, I hate to bring this up, but I, the building per permit fee, I just don't feel like we should raise the, the building permit fee by 1% because I really, I have always thought that the building permits fees were too high as it is. And, and so, I've, I mean, I understand the others. I'm not real excited about, you know, adding 1%. Uh, even though it's what's been four years, two years since we've done it before? It's been longer than two years since we raised yeah. any fees. But uh, I just, I, the, the, the building permit fee is what really bothers me. I know that that generates the most revenue in our fee schedule, but you know, the whole point of building permits and fees are for the safety, and I understand that, and I mean, I, I, I understand everything that is involved in building permit fees, but and I, I know that, you know, we're, we're supposedly in the middle or maybe higher than most some of the other cities of our size. Anyway, I just, I'm just not excited about putting, raising the permit fees by 1%. I would actually. Your concern, like to, if I can reiterate, your concern is specifically plan review and building permit fees. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would like to see yeah, them lowered, actually. That, that's no, no real problem. I didn't know we were figuring that in there either. Yeah, I did 1% across, across the entire fee yeah, schedule. Yeah, so that's, that's not that big of an issue. To that certainly isn't going to hurt my feelings. Static. And, and just so uh, you'll know where we are on the pedestrian bridge, we met with a contractor uh, last week, and as it turns out, even though uh, the pedestrian bridge was in the linear park project, and we were hoping that that bid consequently, especially since we were working with the low bid contractor uh, that, that came in on the bridge with the low bid uh, on our project, maybe that would be sufficient. But as it turns out, we're gonna have to go ahead and go through the formal process of uh, uh, issuing a request for proposal. So we're, we're in the process of working on that, getting a, an estimate from the engineers uh, to reduce the size of the bridge abutments because we're going to reduce the width of the bridge 
uh, to save money from 10 feet to eight feet. And that's, that's very sufficient according to the bridge companies we're talking to. And uh, then we're also looking at comparing clear span uh, versus uh, putting some uh, piers and, and abutments in the middle so that we don't have the expense of a clear span and that'll save uh, generally somewhere 50% or more on the cost of the bridge. And so we're looking at all of that and whether we have to deal with the Corps of Engineers. So just to give you a heads up, we, we are working on that now. Okay. Um, and since the subject was broached about bidding, I do want to just alert you to the fact that we're going to be going out um, for bid once all of the bid packages are reviewed um, for uh, over, over the next month and a half in case you're asking, asked any questions. I just want to make you aware of this. We're going to go out for bid for landscaping. Uh, the current bid that we have with Maldonado. We're going out for bid for the sidewalk project, for the bridge project, for the fire department's SCBAs, um, for EMS billing, and um, there's one other that I'm forgetting. But we're going out for multiple bid projects. All of them will be published in the Express News uh, and that will be placed on the city website. So in case you're asked any questions about those. The IDIQ. And the IDIQ, yes, that would be the last one. Anything else? No. Ed? Where do the litigation or our legal obligations fit into this? I mean, is that just something that we're going to work through? That is, you yes, know? sir. That is, they are not, uh, what is recognized in this is the money that we are receiving from TxDOT for the 1560 realignment, mm -hmm. but we have none of the litigation costs in here because uh, generally speaking, we're looking at um, a payment plan, if you will, um, and so we haven't come to a consensus yet with the uh, litigants. Um, we are anticipating, I'm almost positive that at the next council meeting, we'll have a closed session to discuss those. Uh, and at that point, we will include those costs in the budget. That is the one major thing that's outstanding from, from this budget at this time. So and it, it's simply because we haven't come to a consensus that we could feel comfortable with presenting to council yet. And I was gonna touch on that a little bit when we get to closed session. I'll okay. tell you where we are, basically. Okay. So with that prospect of a payment arrangement, then we don't need to consider perhaps COOs? No, in not a, at this point. At this point, okay. Yeah, I, I would say not at this point. Okay, because I mean, you know, if we add that, then our obvious uh, debt service climbs or goes up and we have to consider all that. Yeah, we are trying to, just g again, generally speaking, we are trying to mitigate the impact of any potential litigation costs on next year's budget via a payment plan of some type. And again, I feel pretty comfortable that by, well, I know for a fact that by the next council meeting, we'll have something to present to y'all uh, one way or the other. All right. Thanks. Anything else? No, thanks. Nothing. No? Okay. okay. Rick, good job on everything. Uh, I've got a few questions for you. Where are we on this water and sewer project? Are we still waiting on SAWS? No, we're actually waiting on TxDOT now. Um, SAWS okay. has approved. S SAWS has approved their, SAWS their has impact appro fees and all that? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Generally, just, just generally speaking, SAWS has approved both the water and sewer. They have given us our construction permits. They have not been executed on our part yet uh, for impact fee credits and pro rata refunds. Um, they haven't been executed yet by the mayor because we're waiting for confirmation, uh, written confirmation on what the pro rata refunds and impact fee credits uh, will equate to, okay? Um, we're looking for, uh, let me step back. They typically don't issue impact fee credits or pro rata refunds and dollar amounts until the construction is completed because it's based upon actual construction cost. We have construction estimates. So I'm trying to get them to confirm in writing that assuming this construction cost, we will receive this amount in impact fee credits or pro rata refunds. It's in the general construction permit that we are eligible for all of them, but I want them in writing to confirm that we will receive them. And I'm, that's really based upon our prior um, experience with San Antonio water system. I, will, I want something in writing before we sign off on it. Um, so once again, 
we're still waiting on saws, basically. I mean, you're well, saying that you, it's not just TxDOT. But that is, that is not really a construction issue. From, from a construction standpoint, we're waiting on TxDOT with regard to the, I believe it's the water line, uh -huh. maybe the sewer line, but one or the other. Um, they're still wanting it as close to the property lines uh, as possible rather than as what we would prefer within closer to the right of way so that we don't have to worry about trees and things of that sort. And so TxDOT is, is that's currently under review at TxDOT. And, and one of the issues there is uh, where they want us to locate some of it, they actually want us to to bore. Under, under the trees. trees. I remember that. But. And uh, so we're, we're, we're arguing the point now that that would uh, really be kind of silly, so, for lack so, of a better way to put it. So actually we don't have any, uh, any idea when this might start, basically. We are, we are staying in touch with them and I mean, I would love question. to say yes, Councilman, but uh, yeah. I can't. Okay. With, I don't know. We're, we're almost there, but I can't tell you exactly when we're going to start. Okay. And then I have a couple more questions. Uh, the realignment looks like it might start in mid-2017, and then that 1560 bridge is going to seem like it might start at the same time. My question is you're going to have two pretty good projects going on the same roadway and with a lot of traffic on it. I, 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 is there any way to put one off until one is almost completed or something like that? Or, if it want, or once it happens, it happens? TxDOT is a lot like dealing with saws. Once they start, you don't want to stop them. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I would be hesitant to, to Well, I mean, it's going to it's gonna create problems. Well, I mean. it's, it depends on uh, whether you want to extend the pain. Well, you got a point there. But, but I did yeah. send Jonathan Bean an email today asking for confirmation on that as uh -huh. to whether both are still on target for letting in, in late spring or early summer and, and if they would both start about the same time. So you did ask him. Uh, he I sent an email today. Okay. Yeah. So, well, in, to add misery to company, technically, Hausman Road is supposed yeah. to start at the yeah. same time as well. Right. And I think they're really doing that for costs. I mean, I would be thinking that they would be doing it for cost savings because you hire one contractor to do all of them, mobilization, all that's much cheaper. Okay. And they really are a system that's kind of working together anyway, so. Okay, and getting back to the realignment on, on page 30 of the budget. Uh, Can you tell me the tab, sir? Uh, four. You can answer this one. I think it's a pretty easy one. You have the expected cost of the city on the realignment is, is a half million dollars, and the actual cost is 126. That's because we're getting uh, reimbursement for the right of way. Is that correct? I originally had that um, as a net cost mm -hmm. uh, to the city, so that th if I recall correctly, the net cost is about. Excuse me. The net cost would be a negative three hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and that's because we are actually gaining three hundred and thirty thousand dollars on the project because uh -huh. you take the five hundred and nineteen thousand versus the hundred and twenty six that we had to, which is our twenty percent uh, match that we paid. It nets out to like three hundred and forty thousand that we're gaining. Well, and we also have gaining. A, a commitment from CPS for one hundred and fifty thousand toward that project. I don't remember if that's factored in there or not. That is not. That's for any utility relocations right. that they have to do. All right, and then I so have we're actually focus. on that project. We're doing okay. Yeah. Okay, and then um, under the, I guess we're on tab six now, on, on page thirty-eight. Uh, under the fire department, you we have, and maybe I should know this, uh, uh, but it, you have three point five vo firefighter volunteers. Uh, are, are, are these just volunteers? Are we paying them or, or what, why are they, uh, why under are they the listed? Fire department, firefighter volunteers, those are, those are uh, strictly volunteers. Um, we do provide them some sort of uniform allowance, uh, but that is the only pay that they but receive. But they're unsalaried? Yes, sir. Okay. And the 3.5, it's, it's counting each one as a, as a full-time equivalent, so it's 0.5. So in essence, you have seven uh, volunteers. And then uh, while we're talking fire department, yeah, I know we are here budgeted for, uh, what, 10 or 13 sets of bunker gear, is that correct? Six for next year. I mean, okay, six. But we're, that's what you, what he requested. What, um, I was wondering, uh, when you order these six sets of bunker gear, do you, are these specifically for 
uh, certain firefighters? Are they measured for the sleeve length? And I mean, it's just for certain firefighters, right? You don't just one size fits all, right? They have their own. They have their own. Okay. All right. All right. And then um, the next one, the re-eval for the, uh, uh, gosh, what was it again? Uh, the MVs and stuff. You wanted to you wanted to take it to six years, from two to six years. Yes, yeah. Sir. Uh, you don't feel like that's too long, or you're happy? You're you're good with that. I'd be willing to compromise at five. Uh huh. <laughs> well, you're going to actually have to do it. Don't actually, don't don't do that so easily. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, Talk you're going to actually gonna have to do right it at five it. years anyway to get it in at six. So you are actually doing it at five, right? It takes us about four months to to put it together. So. Well, uh, it, it wouldn't be a year. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're if you're confident that six years is okay, I'm 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 okay with six that. years is just purely for efficiency for staff here. That is, okay. in in going through the salary chart. Um, I also th I said purely, but I also think it will add some stability to a system that we have been changing every two years. Right, that's the main thing is so that we don't move people from you know, grades and steps because we're adjusting every two years. So six years seem like a comfortable number. And honestly, after a, a extended period of time versus two years, in two years, now this is all, the, the step and grade chart is based upon changes in the consumer price index. So every two years, the change in the consumer price index is may not, it's probably not gonna be that high and it may actually go down. So that could actually negative impact the grade and step chart. I've, I have never seen a consumer price index over the course of six years go down. Um, so it's liable to benefit employees over the course of six years versus every doing it two years. Okay. And we could always change that if we needed to, so. Anyway. This is, yeah, this is just, this would just be a policy change. Mm -hmm. There would be no ordinance or anything with it. It would okay. just be your blessing to do so. All right. And then on the, uh, where am I, tab six still, on the proposed job description of, a, of the animal control slash code enforcement officer, it says qualifications must be able to pass a, a background check, but it doesn't say anything about a drug, te a drug check. That's included. It is included in the back, because I've noticed on the other, uh, like the new officer, police officer that we're hoping to get and all that, that, they, that include, the, there's actual verbiage in there that says drug check. I, I can check that, but I can tell you our policy now. That's in our policies and procedures. Our policy now for, in HR is to do our own background check um, on every employee, and there are quite a few things that we're doing background checks on, and to do a drug analysis on every employee uh, prior to them being hired. Okay. And uh, we, we don't do that with the temps, right? Yes, all we they, do. All they, huh? Yes, we do. We oh, do backgrounds. Do? We do backgrounds because they work with children and we do. Um, you do an actual drug test and on them? And we do drug tests on them, yes. Okay. And if they decline a drug test, they're terminated. Okay. And uh, on the same deal here uh, about public works, on the thumb drive uh, on page 13 of the public works uh, tab, um, I was, I'm kind of confused. There's a, there's a paragraph in there, and I'll just read it to you. This is on their official request, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. I don't, I don't have know that in if front I need to either. ask uh, Josh or what. But I'm kind of confused. Uh, uh, it says the city has two part-time employees in public works slash animal c control slash code enforcement department assigned the duty of responding to all CE slash AC calls. Um, I, I thought we only had one part-time employee, and that was the code enforcement. We have a part-time code enforcement officer, and last year, council approved a part-time employee for public yeah, works. Yeah, but we didn't hire one. That is right. correct. Okay. I think that's what it, they're referring really to. We don't really have correct? two part-times right now. Yeah. Dustin does have part. Okay, yeah. so he's considered part-time then? He's public no, work. He's no, he's public works, but he does animal control also. So and, we're and just he's designating part-time. Yeah, that that could have been control. worded better. Okay, um, well, I was just I, I thought it had only, something. We only have one part-timer, and that's uh, Joe and Cena, our code enforcement officer. Okay, and then if if what I'm reading is right, uh, Joe is going to be in charge of Dustin. Joe will be in charge of Dustin for code enforcement. For code enforcement, yes, sir. Training. Okay. Mm -hmm. For training. Okay, and then one last question. Um, how are the department heads doing on their 
uh, employee evals. Have they all finished them? No. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we just started on that today. Our HR department sent out, or will be sending out an email tomorrow uh, that all employee evaluations need to be completed by September 16th. Um, have, you have a set deadline, okay. September 16th, I believe, is the deadline. That's a Friday. Um, and then they come into the HR department. Okay. That's all I had, Mayor. Okay. Um, Alex, back to you. Any follow-up? No, sir. Paul? No, sir. No? Cynthia, any follow-up? No. Ed? No, sir. Bert? How do you Anything use else pop into your mind? Just <laughs> no? <laughs> How do you use a thumb drive? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Well, uh, uh, as always, uh, if between now and the next meeting, if anything does uh, come into mind in the form of a question, feel free to, to uh, give uh, either Rick or me a call, and we'll try and help you out. And uh, that being said, uh, we'll go on to our next item, which is item number 12. <clears throat> and this is something uh, new that we're, we're doing. And uh, on your agenda request form, uh, Rick did a, a good job of explaining why we're doing this. And basically, it's just... I did not do that, sir. That was Grace. Grace did? Okay. Grace. Uh, uh, well, then Grace did a good job of explaining it. But basically, this has evidently been in the code uh, for some time, but, but uh, it wasn't really picked up until Texas Municipal League... Uh, it was brought to their attention evidently and they put forth an opinion and it just says that a city on a budget after the uh, the, the first public hearing which is the one that's required by code that uh, the uh, council takes action on the budget and as you see here if you don't want to approve the budget and uh, since it would be a little premature to do that they're recommending an action to postpone to the uh, final budget date. And uh, since we do have a second public hearing on the 8th, the question in my mind was then does that require another uh, item uh, after that uh, hearing so that we would have two uh, actions that we would have to take, one for each uh, public hearing. But we came to the conclusion that uh, we'll just call this one the official public hearing and the second one, a bonus that we give uh, to the citizens. And so if you guys would consider, rather than taking action, postponing this item to uh, our meeting on September 22nd. Of course, you have the prerogative to postpone it till uh, September 8th, uh, the night of the second public hearing. And then you can always, when you look at it, as an option, postpone indefinitely, which would kill it and then we could bring it back after the second public hearing. So that being said, uh, the easiest would be to just have a motion to postpone to September 22nd and we'll not worry about it next meeting. Did, did that make sense to you? Not really. Okay. <laughs> I don't understand I, why we're, I don't, who's the one who said we had to do this? The Texas Municipal League filed an opinion which is on the bottom of the request form. We have to take, so you, you have to take some action according to the Texas Local Government Code. And they're saying even if that action is postponing uh, to a future date or a future time certain, that would be sufficient. So the easiest thing to do here would be to postpone taking action on the budget as a result of this public hearing until our final meeting on the budget, which would be September 22nd. Is it okay to and ask? I won't, I won't go into the rest of it because it's just kind of convoluted anyway. Yeah. Is it okay to ask a question? Sure. Um, okay. I thought we wanted to get our budget done at a, at a certain date so it would be easier for Grace to, to turn it in. Is, will this give you enough time? Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, there are some things that are due before September 22nd, but we're just telling them that's the earliest we can get it because it doesn't coincide with any of our meetings. Am I right on that, Grace? Correct. Yeah, so 22nd is fine. Okay. And that's really, uh, since we have a second uh, hearing on the ad valorem tax rate, we can't take action on the night we have a public hearing on the ad valorem tax, so that'll have to wait till the 22nd anyway. So see, in, in the, the infinite wisdom of the geniuses in Austin, 
in trying to simplify the process, they do nothing more than complicate it even further than it uh, was difficult to understand before. So again, the best and simplest motion would be for someone to just simply make a motion to postpone item number 12 until our meeting on September 22nd. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we postpone uh, this agenda item number 12 until our meeting on September 22nd. We have a motion from Buys. Do we have a second? I'll second that. And a second from Villanueva. Any discussion on this postponement? No. Okay, then uh, we have a, a motion and a second to postpone action as required uh, by the local government code uh, since we had a public hearing tonight and we're going to postpone it till September 22nd. So all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Okay, motion carries and that, that item will come forward on September 22nd as unfinished business. Uh, item number 13 is discussion and direction on the City of Holotus Economic Development Corporation's fiscal year ending uh, budget. And so um, we don't really, since there's no action required that I remember seeing, this is just discussion and direction. So uh, who wants to start discussion on the EDC budget? Anybody want to volunteer? I may, may I comment first? Sure. Uh, this item wasn't necessarily, it didn't need to be on this agenda, but given the fact that uh, the EDC will only meet one more time in September, uh, September 21st, as a matter of fact, to approve it, I wanted to see if there were any comments or suggestions from council. So to I take, take back that, to the EDC? Take that back to the EDC. Um, and so that's where I'm going with on this item. So. Okay, so this is a, a matter, and the, and the EDC's budget is under tab three, which was the public hearing one and so if you have any questions you want to start yeah i do have a question on the the personnel salary and benefits it's going up nineteen thousand almost twenty thousand dollars can you explain that that is because i have consolidated both the benefits um the benefits into that one line item so you can see that prior to that it was or this fiscal year it's fifty one thousand essentially and about fourteen thousand in benefits and so I've consolidated both of those and just put them into one line item. I see. Okay, and then add it a little bit. Yes. I see. Um, okay. I don't see that, that there's much else going on with the EDC uh, in this budget. Um. There, there is not. I mean, the, the, the highlights are uh, they're transferring out again uh, as part of a two, this is the second year of the three year deal. $150,000 uh, to the city's debt service account. Um, they are proposing to redo, or excuse me, extend for the second year the retail strategies agreement for $30,000. Um, they do have money in here for the parking lot lease agreement in Old Town of $6,000. And they are proposing $15,000 in conceptual design land use planning. Uh, for the variety of uh, developments that potential developments that we have, essentially as uh, okay. as a, a grant, if you will, a cash grant, where we actually or an in-kind donation, if you will, where we perform some of the engineering services, like the conceptual design and all of that, for them, uh, or site planning. Um, last year they or this fiscal year they authorized seventy five hundred dollars and so we've increased that to fifteen thousand uh, for next year um, they've also increased uh, some of the marketing expenditures uh, and that's really the 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 fundamental um, changes from last year to this year. Um, one of the board members uh, did discuss with me after the meeting that he was somewhat disappointed <coughs> in this year's budget for the EDC because he doesn't feel like uh, there is, um, he feels like after the Linear Creek Park and after the water and sewer that there isn't sufficient direction, I guess, if you will, for the EDC at this point. And so they are requesting that we have, that we have a new, um, take a new look at the uh, strategic plan for the EDC to see what kind of capital projects um, that they can be focusing on subsequent to the linear park or the water and sewer. 
whether that's additional water and sewer lines or what have you. So it wasn't, they weren't unhappy with this budget. It was just kind of, they felt like it was sort of in limbo. There wasn't much going on. That's what it looks like to me, that there's no direction. But one of the things that bothered me when I, I heard the tape of the meeting that they had after the meeting that we had together was it seemed like some of the new ones especially don't understand the didn't understand that they needed to look at the Helotus, our, our whole master plan, the old town plan. They didn't have any knowledge of that, of why they were even, why, why was a linear park even on the books? I mean, you know, one guy says, well, if it was for me, I, I, I wouldn't want it. But that's not the way these, you know, these things are done. They need to look at our old town plan that's in relation to the, the city's master plan and, and it seems like the new people don't know that. And so if they would look and they would read it, then they would maybe have some idea of what the city, now granted it's been, what, since we, we did the city's master plan, it's been since it's 2009? Been, 2008, I think, I think we finished the Old Town plan in 2007, and then we looked at that in 2009, I believe. Yeah, so it's, it's, still, it's still viable. I mean, it's not that old. And so I was just disturbed that I heard some comments that was very clear that they had not read either of those. And they did, so I think that that's one, of, that's one thing. It's not just, just the Old Town Plan, but the whole city, what the city is looking for. I think that would be a little helpful if that would, they would come. Well, when we go through the strategic plan, I'll make sure that we go over those documents as well. Yeah, make sure that they do that, because I don't think that, that, that they know that. Uh, but yeah, this does look like it's in limbo, that there's no real direction. And I think the president needs to get on board and give some direction and help with that. The president of the EDC. Okay. That's it. That it? Mm -hmm. it? No comment. No comment? Mm -hmm. Paul? No, I'm good with it. Alex? I'm fine, thank you. Bert? Well, I think the EDC is still waiting on the retail, what is it, retail strategies in the, in the uh, Freeze and Nichols report. I mean, they, they have not been completed yet, and until they do, I mean, they, they spend a lot of money on those two uh, consultants, and I think they're waiting for some direction from them. Uh, until that happens, I mean, you know, they're, they're, these guys are professionals, and I would wait till these guys told me what was the right direction to go in. So that's my opinion on that. No, and, 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 I then, agree, huh? and I agree with you, Councilman. I th the frustration from just one of the board members that came up to me was the fact that there wasn't any tan. It, it was, um, they weren't working on anything tangible any, anymore, oh, i.e. the water and sewer. So that, that was one of the, the concerns that he had. Well, hopefully these consultants can, you know, can, can help out the EDC with that. That's what they were paid for, and they were paid a lot of money. Yeah, and I agree with you. I'm just, just giving you the frustration that he shared with me. Okay. <laughs> we have to remember, though, that uh, Freeze and Nichols is ETJ study, yep, and, and the retail uh, one is um, for retail space, as I, my understanding. But to it, me... It's development. It's yeah. retail developments. Okay. Well, to me, the, the board should be able to find some of their own direction by just being aware of what, what is needed around the city. They shouldn't have to wait for the council to give them direction. Okay. And as you're saying, they should read what we have yeah. if they haven't already, and you can make that available to them. I, mean, I will. It's already there. One more thing. Yeah. Uh, okay. we, we're still, uh, what was the amount that they could spend uh, and it still had to come to city council? I can't remember. Was it 10000 yeah. It's 10000 10, That still holds true. We don't need to. Uh, there, there are no contracts with it that, that council has not already approved. But if there within, were. If there were, would it would have to come they back. They would still have to come to council. Is that correct? Yes, and it would come to council when you approve the budget. Okay. Um, and one of the things I did want to say, uh, the marketing budget. Uh, I, um, it, it looks like it's increasing from 15000 to $30,000, but I negated to say that they did vote uh, at the subsequent meeting to uh, engage John Almarez with Google 360 tours to finish up that service to the rest of the businesses within the community that weren't able to take part in that uh, the last time that the EDC had that program. And so that is where the, I think they authorized up to $8,000. Um, so that's where the $30,000, uh, that's some of the bump in the $30,000. Well, he was paid 
10,000 before, and he was supposed to do 52 or so? Yes, ma'am. And so there's about 40, 30 to 40 businesses left, significant businesses that, that have not had that 360. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah? Okay. So you know exactly what to tell the EDC? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, that brings us to the closed session and uh, um, item 14. We got 14. Oh yeah, 14. I circled it and I just, uh, I guess my brain thought we went past it already. So this is discussion and direction on the proposed uh, ad valorem tax rate for 2016. And uh, last week, or last meeting, uh, you guys agreed to set that at the current uh, 35 cents per 100 valuation, not to exceed that, but of course you can always go below that, but uh, this is discussion and direction. So uh, we'll start discussion. Ed, you wanna start? Any discussion on ad valorem tax rate? A recommendation in the budgets to leave it where it is at 35 cents per 100? Yeah, my recommendation is to leave it where it is. I, okay. I think the budget's you know supported by it, so. Alex? I concur to leave it where it is. Okay, Bert? Yes. Okay. Paul? So. Leave it where it's at. Leave it where it's at. Okay. So that is your direction. <laughs> okay. Then that takes us to the closed session. And again, we, we won't be having one tonight. So we'll be uh, essentially pulling this. And then the action item number 16, we'll pull that also. Uh, just to give you a, a, a feel of what's been happening. Uh, some months ago, the direction uh, that was given to Rick and, and me was to start uh, some kind of negotiation with uh, the uh, plaintiffs in these three um, litigations. <clears throat> and so we, we did that through our attorney. And of course, they asked us to uh, begin the negotiations, which we did. It took uh, quite a while to hear anything back, uh, but we finally did, and we responded within 24 hours, and then it took multiple weeks to hear back from them again, and um, they came back with um, a proposal that we again answered within 24 hours. And then it took multiple weeks, and we just started hearing back again this week, and we got some uh, uh, promising uh, numbers and proposals from them that uh, we're going to be meeting with the attorney, our city attorneys next week, and try and get this thing concluded as far as knowing our responsibilities uh, in the uh, payments of. Uh, these um, cases and have that for you on the meeting on the 8th. And so that's kind of a summary. And as Rick alluded, uh, it does look like we are bringing the total down that it's gonna cost us. And it looks like uh, at least two of the uh, parties, mainly Continental Homes and Ashton et al, uh, will look at up to a five year payout uh, at, at some pretty good terms. And the TAB and Greater San Antonio Builders Association uh, maybe will go a two year, um, and they're all lowering the numbers. So that's kind of what we're working with now. So hopefully we'll have some, some firm numbers and news for you at the next meeting, and we'll have a closed session on that before we reach any decisions. So hopefully that helped you. And just know that we, we are working. The frustrating part is it, of it is that we answer within 24 hours and then we usually have to wait for several weeks to get anything back. And that's where we are. So if there are no objections, we're at the end of our agenda and uh, I will adjourn us and I'll look at our official time. <coughs> we're adjourned at 9.04.